Hello, everybody. Welcome to the three L's, the difference between learning disability, low ability, and low literacy. My name is Wendy Sweeney. I am the manager for Panda. We provide disability support services for adult basic education. I'm also a licensed psychologist. Um, so when I'm not at Panda, I work in a private practice where I provide um, mental health services. And I also do formal testing for learning disability and ADHD. So I will be speaking a lot from that expertise today during our session. I'm gonna turn off my video so I'm not distracting. Um, I wanted to make sure that you were able to print up the two handouts that were in the participant uh, handout folder in the flyer. If not, I believe Gail is going to chat out the links to one is just a, um, a handout rather than giving PowerPoints, it's an interactive handout, but it also has a, a very um, important links on that handout and then fill in the blank as I go through the PowerPoint. And the second handout is for an activity we are going to be doing at the end of the workshop. So I hope hopefully you will be able to get those if you haven't already. Uh, I want to shortly um, or briefly talk about our website. This is Panda's website. Part of what we really do as part of our services is we keep this website updated. We provide all kinds of really wonderful information. It was developed for adult basic ed teachers and programs. Um, I will be referring to this website at certain points in the workshop, but I want to especially make you aware of the categories on the right side, which has several different diff types of disabilities and with in each one of those categories is information about the specific disability instructional strategies and community resources. So here are the objectives, things that we will be talking about and you will be learning by the end of the session. First, I am going to be talking about reading and writing, learning disabilities and symptoms. I will be talking about students with low ability and valuable resources. And then I'm going to be speaking about the complicated nature of ESL student learning. And um, towards the end, we will be talking about tools to help you distinguish between the three L's and also learn methods to improve instruction for all students. So the first thing I want to start off with is to talk about apparent and non-apparent disabilities. And what I mean by that is that I think a lot of people think the services we provide are related to apparent disabilities um, or dis something you can see, in other words. So for instance, someone who's in a wheelchair, uses a cane, has a hearing aid, um, you would know to ask questions of that student to find out how you could accommodate them in your classroom and what they're learning. On the other hand, there are non-apparent or hidden disabilities. And these are the questions I probably spend the most time answering. So by non-apparent, I mean it's hidden. You can't see it. You would not even know that the student has a disability unless they were to disclose it to you. They may not even know that they have a disability. But examples for that might be a learning disability, ADHD, a brain injury, mental health conditions, for example. So just wanting to distinguish that, and we will be talking about the hidden disabilities today. So I'd like you to take a minute to share in the chat box if you have ever had a student you suspected had a reading or writing disability, such as dyslexia, and if so, what symptoms did you notice? Let's take a minute for you to respond in the chat box and then Gail's going to read your responses for me. Okay. 
Okay, um, withdrawal is usually the first symptom I notice in the classroom. Resistance, avoidance, slow and laborious writing, inability to sequence, put words in order, and then repeat that pattern, slower cognitive processing. I suspected due to severe struggles to ever get better at spelling, very intelligent but struggling. Many of my students cannot decode. Um, I have students who described having brain injuries, but maybe didn't get diagnosed. Yes, student was showing no progress even after a year. Dys dyslexia, reversing letters, reverse pronunciation of three letter words. Trouble remembering. Okay, Mixed that's great. Letter. Thanks, Gail. That, that's a great, um, thank you all for sharing. Uh, sorry, we don't have time to read everybody's, but um, I'm hoping that a lot of these symptoms that you're noticing will be addressed as we move forward. So I'm going to first start with what is a learning disability? Technically, it is called a specific learning disorder. And I was so happy when they changed the name to specific learning disorder because previously um, it was called a learning disability in the DSM-4, but the new DSM-5, DSM stands for Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It is the um, Bible, let's say, for um, all mental health professionals and physicians for diagnosing individuals with certain conditions. So I think that a lot of people hear the term learning disability and they think it's an umbrella term that describes any student who may have learning challenges. And so I was so happy when they changed the name to specific learning disorder or SLD because it also is what the K-12 system uses in diagnosing a specific learning disorder. So I mentioned to you that I do formal testing as part of my other job. And to diagnose a specific learning disorder, you do need to have formal testing completed. So I'm going to describe for you the three specific areas I'm looking for when I am determining if an individual has a possible specific learning disorder such as dyslexia. The first thing I'm looking for in the testing, it does the individual have at least average intelligence because a specific learning disorder is not about intelligence, it is how they are processing information. And so the second piece of information I am looking for is do they have a significant processing deficit? which is a neurological condition. So I'm looking at how are they taking information in, how are they integrating it in their brain, and how are they producing that information. And then lastly, if I see both of these two pieces of information, then I am looking at is that significant processing deficit impacting them at a statistical difference academically? whether it's in reading, writing, or math, and sometimes it can be both or all three. So this is a lifelong condition and neurological. So I wanna do a demonstration to help you understand what do I mean when I say a significant information processing deficit. So what I would like you all to do is to, when I say go, I would like you to count all of the upside down V's in this passage as quickly as you can, um, not including the top one, but count them as quickly as you can and put your answer in the chat box as soon as you know your answer. So go ahead and start. Hey, Wendy, somebody just, we're getting them in now. They're all coming in. Tell me when they stop coming in, Gail. Okay. 
They're still coming in. Still coming. Slowing down. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the answer is 12 for those of you who, who did the entire exercise. And the purpose of how quickly, I, I want you to notice how quickly Gail said, oh, they're coming in quickly. And then there were some that were straggling behind. And that is an example of how quickly each of us processes information. Not to say any of you have a significant processing deficit, but when I'm talking about how you process and how you or other people process information, the speed with which an individual can process new information is what I was measuring there in this demonstration. And so some of you were able to come up with the answer very quickly. Others may have taken more time to process that information. So when an individual has a significant information processing deficit, and this is just one example of that, um, I like to explain it in the way of, if you can imagine, as we take information into our brain, for those who don't have a specific learning disorder, the information hops on Highway 94 and speeds down the little zooms in our uh, parts of our brain into the file cabinet, the correct file cabinet in the brain. Whereas somebody who has a specific learning disorder, they still can learn the information, but there is a roadblock on Highway 94. So they have to take all the back roads home to get to the right file cabinet in the brain. So let's talk about the different types of specific learning disorders. The first one is reading, also called dyslexia. I think that's a term people are more familiar with in the community. Um, and it's also sometimes called specific learning disorder with impairment in reading. There's math or dyscalculia is another word for it, or specific learning disorder with impairment in math. Or writing or dysgraphia, specific learning disorder with impairment in written expression. And today we are not going to be talking about math. We will only be talking about reading and writing. However, I wanted to make you aware that there is a specific learning disorder impacting math and it's like uh, dyslexia for math. It's the best way to, to explain it. Then there are secondary difficulties that come along with a specific learning disorder. And some of these, some, you mentioned in your chat about what symptoms did you notice? Um, and these might things you might see first. And um, one is feeling some low self-worth. For instance, I evaluated a student who received special ed services uh, in the K-12 system. And she was embarrassed to go to the special ed classroom. She went to a separate room to get extra help. She was embarrassed to go down there because in quotes, that's where the dumb kids go. There's some low self-worth comparing each other to other peers, extreme frustration because of the length of time it takes them to get things done, a lot of fatigue and sometimes some mental health uh, challenges such as anxiety or depression. So what is dyslexia? I love this picture that is on the screen uh, it's a, a, a picture of an MRI of a brain of a non-impaired reader, meaning somebody who does not have dyslexia, uh, to a reader who does have dyslexia. So when they did the MRI, they had the individuals reading so they could see what part of the brains are accessed when reading. And as you can see with the non-impaired reader, there are three specific areas that light up in the brain to help individuals read. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the brain with the reader with dyslexia, you see there's only one area of the brain that is lighting up. And as you notice, if you compare the two, the one that is lit up on the reader with dyslexia is much larger than the one on the non-impaired reader. So they're overcompensating 
to try to read. So this is not for lack of trying. It is a neurological condition. And it doesn't mean that they can't learn to read, but they need to be taught differently. So I would like to show you this very short video. The last time I tried to play a video in a virtual workshop, it didn't go well, but this is only two minutes, so we're gonna give it a shot. And if it's not working for some reason, Gail's gonna let me know. So let's see if this will work. All I knew was that I couldn't do what other kids were doing. Grades were bad, self-esteem started to collapse, I was a bit of a board, and it was just gobble, gobbledy good to me. I could tell I just wasn't that confident. Do you think that there's something wrong with you, or you think that maybe you're making it up in your head? There are symbols, but they don't seem to have any real significance. Dyslexia robs a person of time. Frankly, at our school, we were very scared of his profile. You may be dyslexic if you can't spell and have messy handwriting, but your writing shows terrific imagination. Art is definitely where I found my safety zone. I think it's a dyslexia that it's positive for creativity. You can be the smartest person in the world. You can even be a Nobel Prize winner, but you still won't be one. The unforeseeable conflict was blockers. I still don't know how to use them. Patience is continued. Perseverance it is critical when you have dyslexia. Even if you feel uncomfortable doing it, you have to push yourself to do whatever it takes. I might look really silly, but at the end of the day, I'm going to do well on a test because I have 500 flashcards sitting on my desk. I realized the only way I could read is if I underlined or highlighted. It's so important to just own it. Just totally own it. Wow, I just wrote a 74 page document. I'm so ready to go. You know, what's next? Okay, I hope everyone was able to see that. I didn't hear that you that you did not. So um, I really love that that clip. It's a clip from a documentary that I would highly recommend you watch if you have time. Um, they say it's the D word on that little snippet, but they changed it to the big picture rethinking dyslexia is the name of that documentary. There's another one called Journey into Dyslexia. They're both very, very good. They interview experts in the field. They interview famous people who have dyslexia. Um, and it's, it's very eye opening. I highly recommend it. So now I would like to do one more demonstration and I will need a volunteer for this. I would like somebody to read this out loud for me. Um, so if you would either um, say in the chat box, somebody that might be willing to read this for us or you can click on the reaction button under the more on your bar where you can raise your hand either way. And Heather's going to choose somebody. Anybody willing to volunteer, Heather? It looks like Jeremy would be willing to volunteer. Perfect. Okay, Jeremy, can you un unmute yourself and start reading this for us? Okay. Mao de textauli site be ideal for saumitha reading disorder. Harbly. New ages are out there for accessibility. They actually increase curriculum of missile delight for lust and abuse. Says, did you hear that? I did. Thank you so much. Tell me before you put your mute button back okay. on. What was that like for you, Jeremy? Uh, it felt very silly and confusing, and. Uh, and I think it feels silly because it's uncomfortable. And so I, I laugh to uh, deal with the how uncomfortable it is. I don't know if I'm speaking English, Spanish, or what. I don't know what language it is. It's it's uh, just, uh, it, it, was, it was uncomfortable. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate you volunteering. So um, 
this is an example of what it's like for an individual with dyslexia. Now, I want to make clear it's not that they see the words this way, but they have to consciously think about every single word. They are word by word reading. So, for instance, when I'm reading or you're reading, you can be reading something and thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight or what you're going to be doing this weekend and still get the gist of what you're reading. That is not true for an individual with dyslexia. They have to consciously pay attention to every single word and often have to go back and reread because they may skip words. They don't know. It slows them down. It's very frustrating and very fatiguing. So reading out loud in class, as Jeremy noted, it's very embarrassing for individuals with dyslexia to be reading out loud in class. I've heard from several people that that the, was the worst thing in their childhood. Um, so being aware of that. Thanks again, Jeremy. So just to um, talk a little bit more about dyslexia, uh, the things to be looking for in your classroom are problems with word recognition. It's a, phonem a phonemic issue, phonemic, hard word to say. Um, they have trouble connecting sounds to the letters. And there might be a lot of guessing that goes on because they're smart. They may be guessing at some of the words they're seeing. For instance, uh, somebody read for me, read fragile for the word fatigue for me. So they're close, but not exactly. So they see the beginning or pieces of it, but not the actual word. Um, so obviously trouble breaking words down, decoding them, and then the opposite, trouble encoding or spelling the words that goes hand in hand. And as you notice, the frequent rereading, slow reading, and then reduced reading comprehension. So I want to give you a couple examples of people that I diagnosed with dyslexia. One was a mechanical engineer who had excellent math skills, but really struggled with reading and writing and wasn't sure why. I also um, assessed a policeman who had great common sense, was a hands-on problem solver, but was getting poor reviews at work because of frequent spelling errors. So those are just a couple examples. So now let's turn to dysgraphia. I'm not going to spend as much time on dysgraphia, and this is why of all the thousands of people that I have assessed, the majority of them have dyslexia when they have writing difficulties as well, because like I said, reading and writing go hand in hand. So there's only been a few instances where I've actually diagnosed dysgraphia. And this um, picture of a sample writing on the right hand side shows what it might look like for somebody who may have dysgraphia. And typically it's irregular letter sizes and shapes, then not being able to understand poor grammar, uh, punctuation is poor, trouble expressing ideas, although Although poor gra grammar and trouble expressing ideas can also be part of dyslexia. Um, the biggest one is there's clear motor control challenges when writing. That is much more of a red flag for me when I'm diagnosing dysgraphia. So I want to take a minute to describe what a specific learning disorder is not although these all impact learning. So technically this is not a specific learning disorder is low ability, which we're gonna be talking about next. Low literacy, we will also be talking about, but ADHD, sometimes uh, there is a comorbidity, meaning they may have a specific learning disorder and ADHD, but ADHD is a separate diagnosis. Brain injury, also separate, but there can be symptoms that mimic in all of these, and then mental health challenges as well. <clears throat> so these are things that I'm actually ruling out when I am doing my assessments. 
So now let's talk about what is low ability. It is technically called intellectual disability. That is the proper term to use, although there's been many different terms in our history around this topic. Uh, you may have heard terms such as developmental disability. In the K-12 system, they call it DCD, which stands for developmental cognitive disability. And in um, well, something that's not appropriate at all anymore is mental retardation. Basically, we're talking all about the same thing, but intellectual disability is the proper term now. So when determining if an individual has an intellectual disability, I'm gonna be focusing on students born and raised in the United States for this section. And that's not to say that uh, individuals from other cultures don't have intellectual disabilities, but it's a lot trickier to diagnose, especially initially. So I, that's, I will talk about that in a little bit. So when a student has low ability or intellectual disability, they have shown little to no level gains. Now they may show little bumps up and down, like you might see tiny bumps uh, when doing CASA or TABE testing, but not any steady level gains. And they appear to plateau academically at a certain point um, and typically do not read above a fourth grade reading level. So they would be fourth or below. And then the skills are just not improving even after several strategies are tried. So how do you find out? This, this is where I, I really am a promoter of being more proactive, finding out what an individual may be having challenges with when they come into a program so you can serve them better. But oftentimes I will get called from teachers or programs wondering about a student that's been in their program for several years sometimes, and they have not made any level gains. So the first question, again, if they're US born, this is when we can be a little more definitive at this point. Did that, that student receive special education services in the K-12 system? asking that question. And if so, would they have that document, even if it's older? Um, because they probably, if they receive special education services, they would have received what's called an IEP or Individualized Education Plan. Um, or a 504 plan is another document used in special ed, but that's typically more for mental health or for ADHD. Um, so if that's the case, then what was the special education category? For intellectual disability, you would be wanting to look at that document to see if it says DCD or MMR is the older one. Um, there's all different categories on special education documents such as SLD, which we just talked about, specific learning disorder, ADHD, EBD stands for Emotional Behavioral Disorder, or TBI for Traumatic Brain Injury, but there are actually 13 different categories in special education, which I'm not going to get into quite yet, but just so you're aware of those. Um, and then the next thing to look for is, or to ask the question is, is a student in a group home? That's a red flag or if they have a caseworker or social worker that tells you they are not functioning well in the community on their own. They need support in the community. And then are they receiving any uh, disability services or getting social security disability? Normally they would need to be on social security disability in order to get those services in the community. Um, so, being aware of these things and also being aware, aware that um, what happens is when I um, have students that are referred to me, 
And then I find out, I uh, interview them. And when I find out they have a caseworker or social worker, I ask them to sign a release to me so I can connect with that caseworker and social worker to find out what exactly is the diagnosis and is this appropriate fit for them. So um, if they are in that MMR or DCD, then I have a conversation with the social worker about what adult basic education is. And I think a lot of times people are afraid of discriminating, but you have to think about the intent and purpose of adult ed. And is it really in the student's best interest? The example I just gave that student who was attending regularly, the program loved her, the teacher loved her, but she was very frustrated and wasn't satisfied as all her peers were going into other classrooms. So thinking about what is in this individual's best interest. So what I typically do is I um, suggest printing up this resource page, which is on our website under the di intellectual disability category, and then go to resources. And I have all kinds of resources that are more appropriate and a better fit for individuals like I'm describing, where they can be learning job skills, social skills, um, and many of the resources on there have academic components. I have sent this link to many social workers and case workers who have been very appreciative because they're not all aware of all the resources that are out there. So I have both Metro and Greater Minnesota resources on this page. So now I would like to switch gears and talk about English language learners and learning difficulties. It's complicated. It is very complicated for a number of reasons, which I'm going to be talking about. First off, we have students from very many different cultures in uh, adult ed classrooms, which complicates um, diagnosing an individual for a lot of different reasons. And I'm going to be talking about those now. So the first thing I want to talk about is the theory of language development by Jim Cummins. And it, what Jim discovered is he called what he calls BICs or basic interpersonal communication skills that on average, it takes an adult uh, coming from another culture to the United States that typically takes one to two years to develop sufficient oral language skills. So what I will, when I get questions from teachers who say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure my student has dyslexia because they have excellent oral language skills, but they just can't learn how to read. Well, the second piece of this is that uh, what is called KELP or Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, which takes seven to, to leave a callback number, press five. If somebody's. I don't know what that was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, cognitive academic language proficiency, meaning it takes seven to 10 years to develop the complex grammar, vocabulary, and higher order thinking skills to apply it to academics. So I think it's really important for teachers to understand the length of time it does take to learn English. Other factors is, um, academic background. When I get a student referred to me, I always ask how long have they been in the United States and did they learn to read in their native language and what is their academic background? For some students, they may say, for instance, I attained an eighth grade learning or eighth grade um, level in my native country. And then when I ask more questions, well, how often did you go to school? Um, and sometimes it was only twice a week. Sometimes it was only a couple hours a week. And so it depends on what uh, opportunities they had to um, get that academic um, help. And for, in some cultures, they have to pay to go to school. So there's all kinds of factors that come into play. Um, one study I want to share with you, which was by Wayne Thomas and Virginia Coulier. They did a long-term study of 700,000 ESL students, 
and the most significant variable in how long it takes an individual to learn English is the amount of formal schooling they received in their first language. So it's a really important piece of information to find out about a student before thinking they need to get diagnosed. The next thing is age as said, So the older you are, the longer it typically takes to learn a language. And part of that reason is because our brains are hardwired for sound. So as I'm speaking, I can be speaking very quickly and you're basically predicting what I'm gonna say without much effort. But if I were speaking Somali or Spanish right now, you'd have to really be paying attention because our brains do get high, hardwired as we grow up. And that's why immersion schools are so popular because young children's brains have plasticity, meaning that they can absorb another language very easily. But as we get older, that our brains become less, they have less plasticity. It doesn't mean you can't learn, but it may take much longer. And the next thing is that our English language is really quite complex compared to other languages. Um, I've heard that from a lot of different people and a lot of research that I've done. And uh, for instance, you know, we have lots of different grammar rules. We have many words that have the same sound but have different meanings depending on the context. For instance, the word there, T-H-E-I-R, T-H-E-R-E, T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E all have different meanings. So uh, for that reason. And then lastly, there's lack of standardized tests. As I said, you need to um, have formal testing in order to get diagnosed with a specific learning disorder such as dyslexia. And there's a lack of standardized tests in different languages. Um, the problem with using the tests that I use, they are normed on people born and raised in the United States, and that gives us useful, valid, reliable information. So for an individual who maybe even has very good oral language skills, I have regretted when I have moved ahead and done that testing because some of the questions that are asked, you would not really understand the answer unless you were born and raised here. Um, so I know there are some Spanish versions of tests out there, but the individuals who administer them, there's not very many available. So that obviously that person would have to be bilingual in order to uh, administer the tests. Other things to pay attention to is um, some of our ESL students have never had their vision or hearing examined. And obviously that would impact learning. So um, highly recommending ruling that out, getting uh, them examined. We have low cost um, organizations that do exams on our website. Also exposure to trauma. Many of our students came from war torn countries. They were in refugee camps. They may have left loved ones at home so there's a lot of trauma involved and that impacts learning and concentration. There may be head injuries, another, uh, another uh, area that can impact attention and uh, memory, adjusting to a new culture. And then lastly, um, for a lot of uh, different cultures, there's a stigma or shame associated with even the term disability um, and they may not have access to being diagnosed in their native country. So being careful about the terms you use with your students. Um, one resource I would highly recommend is called Culture Care Connection. And um, there you can learn about different cultures. It's based out of Minnesota and they have great information about um, the different cultural views about um, disabilities, mental health, medical conditions, and so forth. So I um, would highly encourage you to check that out as well. So these are some questions you could be asking your students to find out more information about them. Like I had mentioned, finding out how much formal schooling did they have, how often they attended school, 
Did they learn to read in their native language? Did they have trouble learning in their native language? Or do they have any conditions that might impact learning to gather more information from them? So now I'm gonna talk about some tools to share with you that I would highly encourage you to, to uh, check out. The first one is um, what we call our supplemental disability registration form. So this was developed at Panda and this came out of concerns for, you know, um, you know, programs and teachers approaching me and asking questions about students. And I, like I said earlier, I'm a big proponent of being more proactive than reactive. So let's find out right when students are enrolling in programs, if they've ever been diagnosed with a condition that in, could impact learning and then giving examples. I think oftentimes programs are afraid to even ask that question, but the only questions I've seen on any registration forms were, do you have a learning disability? And that term can be misinterpreted. So we changed it to this. We encourage programs to add that to their registration form. If they check no, then you're done. You just get go through the registration like you normally would. But if they check yes, then there's another form that you can ask them to complete or you can ask uh, read out loud to them. And we do have this um, form translated in several different languages. And this is located on our website under the forms bar at the top of the page. Here's the second uh, document then that is provided on our website and it just asks, I'm just showing you a snippet of it, but asking more information if they were to check yes. Let's find out what that disability is so we can make sure we're accommodating you in the classroom. What kind of support did you receive? What, would, what kind of help would you like in the classroom? And what specifically is the condition so we can best serve you? And also at the bottom of the page, I have, do you have a caseworker or social worker or a guardian and ask them to sign a release so that you can be coordinating best services for them across the community and in the school. This is another um, tool that we developed and it's on our website called the Adult Learner Intervention. Um, I uh, would highly encourage you that you um, check this out if you haven't already. We really developed this in answer mainly to uh, the ESL population because there isn't any formal testing available at least now or very few of them. So maybe it's not so important to give them a diagnosis as to get the teachers the strategies they need to help the students in the classroom. And so this is what this process is. And it's just going to step one is, are this a student US born or ESL? Step two, we have seven different scenarios that we commonly saw when we piloted this before we launched it. Um, and you choose which one of those scenarios best describes your student. And then you are directed to um, use strategies to help them in the classroom. And if after six different class periods, they're still not doing well, then you contact me and we talk about me doing an interview and screening process with the student uh, where I ask much more in-depth questions about their background and their medical conditions and their mental health and their support and their background educationally, obviously. Other things on how to help students. Um, first, we have at Panda, we have a lending library of adaptive equipment. I would highly encourage you to reach out to us uh, if you would like us to send any of these. This is just a sample of what we have in our lending library, but we have large print keyboards, adaptive mice. We have a lot of writing tools for anybody who has trouble holding pencils particularly for students who have had never had any literacy. We have big pencils, we have a lot of grips, we have amplifiers, we have tons of magnifiers. We loan out all different levels of readers for students who aren't seeing things well and maybe can't afford to get assessed. We have line readers, which are really helpful for students with dyslexia or ESL students um, being able to read line by line. We have several different colors. We have tons of multi-sensory tools such as um, textured 
letters and numbers, and we're going to be talking about multisensory in a minute. Um, but uh, be sure to reach out to us. We will mail them off to you and loan what you need. If we don't have it in our lending library, we will purchase it for you when funding allows. I also want to talk about universal design for learning. That's a training we have going on right now. Uh, we've offered it for the last several years uh, during the month of January. Um, but two of the principles that I wanted to address in this workshop are, um, you know, using multiple methods of instruction. So we, most of us grew up in traditional learning where a teacher would get up and lecture and the student would listen and then read a book and then take a test. Well, not everybody learns that way. And universal De design for learning came out of the disability community with the concept of maybe there is an instructional strategy you use for one type of student, but maybe it's actually going to benefit several different students. So by teaching multiple ways, you are addressing all different learning styles and disabilities at the same time. And on the other hand, also allowing students to demonstrate their knowledge in different ways aside from testing. Um, so whether it's oral reports or PowerPoints, poster boards, doing a play, interviewing somebody, these are all ways of demonstrating knowledge. I also want to mention some technology resources, particularly since I know a lot of you are still teaching digitally or virtually, I should say. Um, on our home page, there is links to how to find accessibility options that are just built right into our computers, tablets, and phones. And a lot of people aren't aware of them. So, um, so that you're aware of it <clears throat> when you're um, virtually teaching, but also to um, let students know about uh, some of the products that are available right within these symptoms. For instance, on um, Microsoft, it's called Ease of Access. In Apple products, it's called Accessibility. But there's all kinds of options within those areas on the computer or phone, cell phones, such as a screen reader called a narrator or vo voiceover. Um, there's magnifiers. Uh, there's um, keyboard shortcuts. You can change the colors on the screens, all kinds of options. So I would encourage you to check those out. <clears throat> and then this is a great resource um, that I also um, talk about in my UDL training called the UDL Tech Toolkit. Um, this has got gobs and gobs of great uh, technology resources in here. Um, some audio books, text to speech, um, such as immersive reader, which highlights words as you read, or Speechify, which is text to audio. They have graphic organizers, such as bubble.us, which organizes ideas visually. Um, under the more little more arrow there, there's literacy tools and writing tools as well. So if we had time, I would love to get into a breakout for you to look at this, but we unfortunately with the short time we have, we do not. So please check that out on your free time. And the last thing I want to talk about is I really want to emphasize multisensory te teaching. This is something I feel is so passionate about um, just from research that I have done, um, from what I know about the most famous uh, or well known multisensory teaching is the Orton Gillingham technique. Uh, so some of you may be aware of that. But the concept of it is that um, when I talk about neurological conditions or even learning styles, that we learn through our senses. And by uh, um, using all of the senses simultaneously, you're accessing different parts of the brain. So for instance, um, tactile measures such as using textured letters or sand or rice trays, carpet squares, um, things such as that. There's kinesthetic, so a lot of movement. Um, how many of you remember going on a field trip in elementary school? That really sticks with you. So actually getting in and doing things, um, doing lab works, uh, you know, even 
have playing games, movements, anything that you can be moving around the room really can access a completely different part of the brain. And then auditory, not just speaking um, in front of the class, but using rhymes, using music, mnemonics, um, uh, even the tubaloos that, um, which ha help with comprehension. Those are uh, in our lending library. And then visually, um, not just looking at a smart board or the computer, but using drawings, graphs, the line readers, highlighters, YouTube videos are all examples. So let's see, how are we doing on time here? I think we've got 15 minutes left. Yep, 15 minutes. Okay, so this is what I would like to do. Gail is going to put you in breakout rooms of six to seven people. And what I would like you to do is if you were able to uh, get the handout, what is multi, multi sensory instruction, take a look at that, um, just to give you some ideas. Um, and then I would like you to brainstorm in your group how to incorporate all of the senses when teaching a lesson about weather. And then please choose somebody in your group to present the ideas to the group. We're gonna have that, uh, each one person from each group just chat your ideas out when you come out of the breakout group. So Gail, let's break out for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and have time to um, share ideas that everyone comes up with. Hey, I'm going to open the rooms now. Great. Thanks, Gail. Okay, can you see my screen? No. Okay, I'm going to have to reshare them. Okay, if everybody would go ahead and start sharing. I, I was in a, a great group of uh, teachers who were sharing a lot of wonderful ideas. So if one person from each group would be willing to jot out in the chat um, some of your ideas for using all four of the senses, that would be fabulous. And then if everyone can be um, looking at the chat box or if Gail, if you would read some of what people are sharing in the chat box to the group, that would be fabulous. Sure. Uh, let's see. Tactile, hold cold things, ice, warm things, microwave stands, weathered objects, leaves, wood, building weather instruments, barometer, rain gauge, visuals, YouTube videos, different thermometers, Graphs and weather maps, reports, draw a memorable weather story and tell the story, listen to the weather, what does rain, wind, thunder, etc. sound like, how does your body react in different weather conditions, shiver, act like you're sweating, act out of the weather, act out the weather forecast or pattern, patterns. Uh, let's see, visual word cards, pictures of the weather, videos, auditory sounds of the weather, listening to the weather report, weather circle. Tactile would be working with cotton balls for weather, water cycle, weather stations. Uh, let's see, get outside. Put, out, put on outer clothes you would wear in various weather. Creating different types of cloud formations. Movement to represent each stage, observation, observations outdoors, choosing appropriate clothing for specific types of weather. Creating unique sounds, sights, weather phenomenon. And visual would be video clips of the forecast, radar, Google map, exploring weather in other parts of the world, creating and labeling pictures. Uh, let's see, Christine said, our group talked about going outside, holding snow, going in and writing about it. Uh, color coding letters. Set up stations around the room to seek out information. Use slips to match information, vocabulary, parts of sentences, monthly calendar. Give news report of the weather. Use videos. Use using audios, audio for stories. That's what we have so far. That's fabulous. Thank you everybody for sharing. 
I just hope that um, as you um, we finish up the workshop here today, that you will keep this multi-sensory instruction in mind moving forward in your classrooms, um, thinking to yourselves, you may not know if a student has a disability in your classroom unless they disclose it, and they do not have to disclose it by law, uh, or they may not know they have it, but at least by doing that multi-sensory, you know you are addressing uh, students that have different learning styles and or disabilities at the same time. So as we end today, um, just want to remind you to please use the tools on our website. Um, and if you have any questions for me because of the short time we have, we don't have time for questions, but I would encourage you to contact me anytime. Uh, we're always here for you at Panda. Just send an email to panda at rdl.org or give me a call. If you need any of the handouts that you um, were unable to print up or, or download, um, let me know and I will email them to you. And um, I want to thank you so much for listening to me today. And I think Gail's going to put up a short poll here before you click out of the workshop. I would appreciate your feedback. So everybody, please answer the poll. And then I want to wish you a fabulous workshop, the rest of the Language and Literacy Institute. I hope you learn a lot. Everybody take care.